When jet-powered combat aircraft first started to enter service in the mid-1940s, the US Navy was an early and enthusiastic adopter of the new technology. But they very rapidly hit a quandary. The initial jet aircraft had been straight-wing platforms, similar to the propeller-driven aircraft they replaced. But even before the end of the Second World War in 1945, engineers had recognised that to get the best performance, swept wings were necessary. The trouble was that these created problems with much higher landing speeds. This wasn't such an issue for land air forces, they could build longer runways. But for carrier aircraft, which needed stable low speed characteristics as they smacked onto a tiny flight deck, it was a real problem. If the US Navy went with building designs that had straight wings, they made carrier operations much safer, but run the risk of operating aircraft that would always be inferior to land-based opposition. If they built swept wings, they could produce much more effective combat aircraft, but at the risk of them being extremely dangerous to operate. How could they combine the low speed stability of the straight wing with the high performance of the swept wing? Naturally, it was Grumman, the US Navy's prime aircraft producer, that came up with a solution, variable geometry wings. This sees the wings capable of pivoting, therefore providing a wide platform for low speeds and a swept wing for high. Nowadays we are used to aircraft with this configuration, but it was a revolutionary idea at the time. No aircraft utilising variable geometry had actually flown at that point. The first, Bell's X5, was in development. Grumman was making a huge technical gamble. Unfortunately, their aircraft, the XF-10F Jaguar, or Jaguar to the cousins, didn't pay out. Or at least, not initially. The Jaguar, and I'll use the American pronunciation because it was an American aircraft, originated as Grumman's Model 83, essentially a cropped Delta Wing version of the F-9F Panther that was in service with the US Navy at the time. The idea was that the F-10F would be an evolution of the F-9F and use several components of that aircraft in its construction. Grumman issued their proposal to the Navy in September 1947, intended for it to have the aforementioned Delta Wing combined with a T-tail. Power plant would be a Pratt & Whitney J42 turbojet engine, an American version of the British Neen, and armament for 20mm cannon as well as hard points for bombs and rockets. Though they ordered the G83 for prototyping, the US Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics weren't particularly keen on the existing concept, so they started messing around with it. First thing they wanted to dump was the engine, and instead the Jaguar would have the new Westinghouse J40 axial flow turbojet engine then in development. They also wanted a radar, specifically the APS-25 that would be built for the F-10F. All of this screwing around with the very fundamentals of the aircraft meant that it wasn't until December 1950 that an actual specification for the XF-10 was agreed upon. The aircraft was to be a shoulder wing monoplane of all metal construction. The nose would house the radar and armament would be the four 20mm cannon along with a maximum bomb load of 4,000 pounds of bombs or rockets on two underwing hardpoints. The tail was of unusual design as well. The horizontal stabiliser was free floating with a small foreplane directly controlled by the pilot. This moved the stabiliser up or down, more like a miniature trim tab on an elevator. Power plant was intended to be the Westinghouse J40 WE8 turbojet rated at 7,400 pounds force dry and 10,900 pounds of force with afterburner. This was expected to give the production F-10F1 a top speed clean of 710 miles per hour. The final design of the Jaguar, as it was later to be designated, was therefore a much larger and heavier aircraft than had been initially projected with the G83 concept. In fact, about two thirds heavier and a third longer. This led to Grumman's suggestion to use a variable geometry wing. It also used very little from the F-9F, with just a few parts of the cockpit structure in common. And so, the F-10F Jaguar was going to be a new aircraft that utilised an experimental engine and a revolutionary concept for flight modelling that hadn't even been made to work properly by that point. Just getting some of these things to work at an experimental level would be, and indeed were at the time, full-fledged development programmes. But with the Jaguar, the Navy wanted an actual service aircraft, not just a proof of concept. 
Of course, we should also bear in mind the circumstances of the time. The Korean War had broken out in June 1950 and military spending shot up. And so in August 1950, even before the specification had been settled, the US Navy ordered 10 pre-production aircraft. This was followed shortly by orders for 123 F-10F-1 fighters and 8 F-10F-1P reconnaissance aircraft. With money basically no object, pre-orders on the books before a prototype had even flown and built exactly to the customer's specifications, everything looked rosy for the Jaguar. It would have to be catastrophically bad to not make the cut by that point, right? Yep. The prototype XF-10F first flew on May 19th, 1952, in the capable hands of test pilot Corwin Corky Mayer. But just getting to that point was a major achievement. Mayer was a hugely experienced test pilot, having been a project pilot on many Grumman aircraft, performed assessments on the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M during the Second World War, and been the first to fly the F-9F prototype, Grumman's first jet. As he put it, when I made my first run to attempt a liftoff, it was obvious to the audience that Grumman had come up with an airplane that would fly strangely, if at all. The airplane and I lurched up and down the runway, as if one or the other, or both, were drunk. These attempts to fly went on for a week or so, causing much hilarity, but my real concern was that I couldn't get the necessary feel or required guts to fly it higher than 10 feet from terra firma. On May 19th, 1952, I got the Jaguar up to 160 knots on the runway, at which speed the canard tail was found to have sufficient control for a first official flight. It was a disaster as far as accomplishing anything was concerned, because just about every system refused to work. This set the pattern for the XF-10. Over the course of some 32 flights that Mayer made, the aircraft exhibited some nasty characteristics. At its best, the aircraft was very sluggish, and at its worst, it was bloody dangerous. The novel tailplane arrangement reacted poorly, but could also set up violent oscillations in the aircraft. Stalling characteristics were described as vicious, and considerable work went into altering the aircraft to remedy this. Worse, the engine proved extremely poor. The J-40 never achieved its expected output, plus the afterburning version that was intended for the production version didn't pass reliability testing until 1952, and was thoroughly dismal. Every test flight seemed to show up a new problem with the XF-10. For example, on the 23rd test flight, the canopy shattered completely, leaving only the frame in place. Mayer needed to put the XF-10 down in a hurry and set about making an emergency landing in the long lake bed at Edwards AFB that was used for just such a purpose. Then his chase plane called him up to tell him that the face cover on his ejection seat was flapping behind him in the slipstream. Mayer described, I reached back, grabbed the rubble handle on the curtain and put it between my teeth, thinking, what a grade B movie this is. As the face curtain had fully extended, I knew the seat was armed and ready to fire. So after touching down on the lake bed and still rolling at 100 miles per hour, I hurriedly unbuckled, scrambled out of the cockpit and straddled the front fuselage ahead of the windshield, facing aft. I had managed to get back onto the ground and I had no taste for an ejection seat killing me by blowing me several hundred feet into the air. Several miles later, the Jaguar came to a standstill on the dry lake after completing a wide ground loop. We later found that debris from the canopy had pulled the firing pin 99% out of its detente. The continuous issues with the Jaguar and the J-40 meant that both were doomed. In April 1953, the Navy cancelled the whole project and the production orders for the type. The one flying prototype of the XF-10F and a second one under construction were then used for barricade testing and as range targets. And so the XF-10F passed into history. No one seems to have had anything like a nice word to say about it, except the only man to have flown the aircraft, Corky Mayer. And that in a rather barbed way. As he put it, it was a fun airplane for me to fly, because it had so much wrong with it. He did also state that an English test pilot made the following complete report about another aeroplane he had flown, and it fit my total assessment of the Jaguar perfectly. The entrance to the cockpit of this airplane is most difficult. It should have been made impossible. But despite all the issues, there was one great success to spring from the Jaguar. 
its novel variable geometry wing platform, which on the face of it seemed the most complex part of the aircraft's development, worked extremely well. On all the flights conducted, and with all the issues experienced, only once did the controls for the wing sweep fail, and then they returned to default open setting to allow safe landing as they had been designed to do in such a situation. In fact, the variable geometry system, despite its complexity, was the one great success on the XF-10, and this would go on to pay dividends on a later Grumman naval fighter, the F-14 Tomcat. So the legacy of the XF-10F Jaguar isn't all bad.